Hi, this is the introduction to functional programming class. My name is Adolfo Neto, and we are here with Bruno Benavides. Bruno, I read that I know that you are an Erlang developer and trainer, and you your role it's according to your LinkedIn is staff soft software engineering at Next Row. That's correct. And you are, you're also the, one of the organizers of Spawn Fest, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it was you. You were also one of the organizers of Elixir Conf LA, where LA means in that case Latin America. <laughs> because That's the right. first time I read, I thought, oh, Los Angeles, but no, there it's no, 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 South America. <laughs> yes, and it happened in last year in. Colombia, right? In Medellin, Colombia, yes. Me Medellin, and I, I believe you said that you you work with Erlang since two thousand and nine. Uh, two thousand nine, two thousand ten, yeah, around that time, yes. So it's ten, ten years or or more. You are a bachelor in computer science at the university from the University of Buenos Aires. That's right. And you said also in one of your talks that you are a programmer since the age of 10. So yep. I'd like to, to start with this question. How did you start programming with the age of 10? All right. So in uh, I lived in a city near Buenos Aires called Lanús, and um, and uh, to my school, my elementary school, they had uh, they, it was a public school, so I only went there for four hours. But they had some extra activities if you want to join, and one of them was uh, a bunch of uh, hippies, I would say, that came every Wednesday, no, every Tuesday and Thursday. In a in a traffic van, and they carried uh, something around uh, like eight or ten Commodore 64, and they they used those machines to uh, teach anybody who wanted uh, visual visual basic, uh, not visual basic, sorry, basic for Commodore, the the original basic, the one with the line numbers and go to instructions and whatever. Uh, my father was one of the first uh, software engineers to get a degree from the University of Buenos Aires as well. And um, they, they actually, he actually started a different career, but when they created this software engineering career, he switched to it. And so that's, that's how he was one of the first, uh, the first ones to, to get the, the full degree. And since he saw that I was interested in in this kind of technology and learning the same things that he he was a master in. Uh, he discussed that it was a, like a huge decision. We were not very rich, but uh, my uncle happened to have a, a trip, uh, just did a trip to the US. And when he was there, my father asked him to bring back a computer so I can program at home. And uh, crazy uncle, instead of bringing a computer, he brought a, a, he, he he bought a, a full-on um, mainframe, like a like a huge computer. It, it was it was uh, it was impressive. It was much like years ahead of every anything that that uh, that we had uh, over there in Buenos Aires. And so I could I could uh, start programming uh QBasic, I think it was, but then other things like C++ and whatnot. And uh, and I basically never stopped. I, when when my friends, they had their, they, I, I also played the games like like my friends did, like say Prince of Persia or or what was it with the pirate, uh, the, the guy, uh, Guy Brush. I don't remember. I don't remember, but the famous adventure play that uh, included included a pirate that was trying to learn how to be a pirate, actually, and Monkey Island, Mon Monkey Island, and, and all those things. But I also created my own games, 
and I invited the, my friends to play the, those games at home with me and whatnot. So eventually, uh, when I had to start to choose my uh, high school, I, I happened to found one in somewhere near my house, like two cities away. And uh, and then I that 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 one also had a career in uh, like a, a, you you could be a technician in uh, in computer and the internet was coming to Buenos Aires for real like with modems and whatnot but we had say Alta Vista we had access to Alta Vista we had access to some other things and that school for whatever reason one of the the teachers there was actually a university professor in in one of the public universities in buenos aires and he got he got us access like free access to the internet for all uh, students in and so so with that and with his help and some others i did my first like real program which was a uh, the management the software for, to to manage, uh, say, uh, what's the name? For the taxi company, uh, the cars and drivers and people like a, a, a group of taxi drivers all together. They they managed everything, and I wrote the software to manage the agency and to and to allow the the phone operator to contact the drivers and the, and the people that needed a taxi. Uh, with that done, my father showed that to the people in his company and they immediately hired me. And so since uh, since the year 2000, I've been working on programming nonstop until today. Oh, that's great. So I'm just going to lay out some rules here for the, the students that are, are watching. If they want to ask a question, you can uh, type in the chat that if you want to to ask the question and then uh, you, you can speak. Or if you want to read one of, of the questions that, that are on Slido, just tell me and I will read the question. And uh, I want to thank you. I forgot to, to thank you, Brujo, for being here. And I, I also thank you for being a, a, a mentor on exorcism. I'm doing a lot of exercise there, and you are my, usually my mentor. And you are also you are also a, a kind of mentor on that future learn course by Simon Thompson. And you do a lot of voluntary work, like in Erlang Ecosystem Foundation. What's your motivation for doing this for the Erlang community? So basically, when I jumped from, uh, say, the, the technologies I worked before, .NET, C Sharp, all the Microsoft bunch, to Erlang and, uh, and basically the the other open source tools that you use, say MySQL, Postgres, or whatever as Linux, etc. I I discovered how to uh, a new way of building systems with the help of people that doesn't work with you. So uh, there is a lot, or, or most of the things that I build have. I would say more than 50% of them are uh, created, written, or maintained by some other people, right? And uh, and I do create my own open source tools, but I think that's not the best I can do. I have uh, some talent for teaching people stuff, and I can put that to to work as a way to give back what I'm getting from the community in my own, say, personal way. So I think uh, if, even if I am not the best at creating the most amazing tools for people to use, I can at least help others uh, create them. And I think that's worth it. And, it. and for me, it's also very rewarding. OK, just. Um... Ah, the, this question is quite basic, so I think you can answer it. Uh, do you work with Erlang 
Elixir or both? At you work at Next Row, right? Yeah, I, I work at Next Row. I work mainly with Erlang because uh, because our largest systems are built with with it. But uh, but I also but we are very very polyglot here. So I work with Erlang, with Elixir, uh, also with Go, Python. Uh, a little bit of JavaScript, even if we wanna, if we don't want to, but sometimes there is no way around it. And uh, even uh, I, I actually worked a little bit, just just a tiny bit, but it was fun with uh, R lang, not not R lang, R lang with an, just the R. It's a it's a statistician language. It's very very nice, very nice. And uh, and I always joke with people and I, that I also actually have it on my on my resume. I also program in uh, Google Spreadsheet, like uh, quite a lot. <laughs> and um, yeah, but yeah, mainly Erlang, mainly Erlang. And did you learn functional programming at the university? Yes, I did with uh, with uh, two or three. Two regular um, courses and one optional one that I also took. Universities in Argentina uh, are, it's, a, it's one of the greatest things there is that uh, the public universities are the best ones. So you get, if you, wanna, if you want to get the best education possible, you don't pay a dime, it's free. And uh, if you wanna get a degree quickly, no, that's not the way. But if you if you really want to learn, the the public universities are great, and um, in particular, the the whole program of the computer science uh, career in uh, University of Buenos Aires. In this is in uh, science because it has uh, university has two branches. You can do engineering or science. I, I choose science. So engineering side, they had some functional programming sometimes, maybe optionally. For for the scientific uh, branch, we have a lot, uh, mostly in Haskell. Oh, that's great. We, I, I have a first. The we here in Brazil also we have public universities. They are free for for the students, and we we have. I work at a public university here, and one of my colleagues, she went to University of Buenos Aires too. And no, but she works with graphs. And ah, the first question from it's not from me here. I don't know if if he can ask in person if it's here. Yes, Herminio Torres. Herminio, can you do you want to ask your question? What do I need to know? Or not sure if he can. So, and I, I'm going to, to ask his question. What do I need to know, learn about Erlang to help me better understand other languages that are built on top of the Bing, like Elixir, Gling, and others? Yeah, so I would say, I would give two answers to this. It, it basically depends on, on what you wanna, what you wanna do with it. So, if you if you want to say create another language or understand how these languages are created there is a great material on the web it's super long but it's it goes very deep and it's very uh, detailed which is the beam book if you if you google for it you will find it it's written by somebody from erlang solutions if i remember correctly and, but but somebody that worked with the uh, Elix, with the sorry, with the uh, Ericsson OTP team uh, for quite a while, and so it's very it goes to the core of the beam, and that's shared by every language built on it. So you will once you learn that thing, you will be able to understand what the languages are, how they are built, and how they operate, and uh, and that's. That's uh, that's the way to understand things from say the the inside out. You will learn how to, how the build is how the beam is built, how the beam works, 
and then you can learn whatever uh, dialect you want to get uh, those things to run as you want to because it's just uh, you have to do the translation right from elixir to whatever you already know but it's a it's a very steep path if you want to start with that it's very very steep because you will not see anything uh, done you will not have any any examples until you are really really familiar with that so it's not for everybody it's a it's a good thing but maybe not for not for somebody who wants to get things on like now which is one of the reasons that elixir was so popular because it allowed you to uh, immediately create something that you can see and show and present and it's still awesome so it's good on the other hand, if you wanna if you wanna uh, learn Erlang only to be able to write code in other languages but know what's going on, I I would say I would say basically the 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 basic concepts, the basic steps to to learn about uh, about this is to start with some functional basis like recursion, pattern matching those things are everywhere it doesn't matter if you if you write code in elixir erlang or Vim or whatever so pattern matching recursion um high order functions that kind of stuff uh, then some particularities that you will always use something like ets or um or um, how to put up a like how to use the erlang shell because eventually you will need it and so like stuff like that the observer things to, to check how, what's going on in a, in a system that's running. But then the, the most important part that's also shared by every language, which is processes, messages, exit signals, all those kind of things, and OTP. The basics of OTP are everywhere, and uh, doesn't matter what language you're using, you might call it gen underscore server or gen server with a camel case, but it's the same thing underneath. And, and those things you will find everywhere. So, so those things, learn those things. Um, a couple of years ago, I actually wrote an article about that stuff in particular. It was called uh, Learn to Forget, and it's in the Erlang Solutions blog post, uh, in the Erlang Solutions blog, sorry. And I basically just detailed all those things one after the other because the usual way of learning this is to solve the same problem with um, with each of those things one after the other. So you first in, in, uh, solve it with a list in the shell, then you solve it with uh, with recursion, then with uh, high order functions, then you add an ETS table, processes, OTP, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, that one, Aminio. Thank you. Ah, great. And uh, am I mute? No. <laughs> and yeah, oh. and there is a, a question from Philippe Bajan. He works at Erlang Solutions, but he's not here. And he asked, where Erlang developers, where do they live? What do they eat? <laughs> it's a, it's a tongue-in-cheek question because uh, because Philippe was uh, trying to get into Erlang Solutions for quite a long time. I interviewed him once and uh, I told him uh, at that time we were looking for a senior developer and he was not. Uh, so I told him that and a couple of years later he came back and he already, he, he at that time he actually was senior. I was about to leave Erlang Solutions and he joined. And, um, and one of the things that Erlang Solutions provided as a, as a good thing was that you can work from everywhere. They hire, they are remote first, so they hire developers from around the world. And uh, and so where do they, where, where do we find the developers? Like everywhere. And uh, and basically the idea here is that we are not too many, and so so no company. No company other than, say, Ericsson, Klarna, the, the, big, the big ones, can have the, the luxury of finding all Erlang developers like just around the corner. So, so uh, if you are an Erlang developer, there, there is a, a high 
high likelihood that you will work remotely. It's very, very likely. So, yeah. And so, this is related to his second question. Is there an IT market for a developer to dedicate his or her career? No, career. Yeah, it's career, but yeah. yeah. Just for coding in your lang, or should we all learn Elixir? Um, I don't think, I think that if you learn Elixir well, you will, you will also be able to work in Erlang if, it, if it's needed. And in the same way, um, if you, if you learn Erlang, you will be able to work in Elixir if needed. They are not that different and the differences are the less important, are far less important than the similarities. So do whatever if you if Erlang if you like Erlang more because like me you you are very uh, a huge fan of say pattern matching and and whatever uh, like uh, immutability etc things that are a little bit not that straightforward in Elixir go with Erlang if you like macros if you like to write uh, simple code that is nice to the eye and whatnot, go with Elixir. Never mind. Just the, the key the key things that you need to learn are not related to the language, the languages, whatever you feel comfortable with. On the other hand, and that has to be said, I know companies that specifically hire Elixir developers, but that's because they, they, they don't they haven't realized yet that if they hire an Erlang developer, they, the Erlang developer will be uh, capable of working with Elixir in a, uh, in a matter of like days. Uh, they, they don't realize that, so they advertise, uh, they look for uh, developers with experience in Elixir. Personally, I think they are limiting their, their spectrum of uh, possible candidates in the, the wrong way, but yeah, whatever. Yes, and I, I can say that there is a famous programmer in the Brazilian Elixir community, which is Charlotte de Oliveira, and she was an Elixir developer here in Brazil. She was hired by, by Klarna to work with Erlang. It, mm -hmm. I think it was one and a half year ago, and then she left Klarna, went to another company to to use Java, and then now she's back in Brazil, but programming in Elixir again. So it's, it's possible, from her example, I see it's possible to migrate from Erlang to Elixir and back. And the next question by Philippe, it's, it's kind of provocative too, but he says, why does it seem that Erlang stopped in time while Elixir is getting so many, so much tooling. Yeah, I can tell you from my experience as a tool creator, I am one of the main maintainers of uh, uh, Elvis, which is the linter for Erlang, and uh, the one of the rebar formatters, which are also formatters for Erlang code. And uh, for both projects, my experience is that the Erlang community is a, the, it's far older than the Elixir community. Like it comes from a long, long time, like 30 years or so. And uh, everybody either solves their, the same problems on their own or they don't think they, don't think they have those problems. And, uh, and so they are not inclined to create new tools like that because they don't seem that they need them. If you gave them one, they are super happy to use it, but the, nobody is like willing to spend their energy on creating those tools because yeah, the systems work, I can manage them, I can monitor them, why will I care? On the Elixir community, on the other side, we have many people that just, that there are many new folks in the community or relatively new folks 
and either they came from communities with uh, much better tooling, like uh, say Ruby, Python, etc., or they are uh, creating the things as they go. And so, for instance, for the formatter, it's it was far easier for Elixir to to have. A, it's not trivial, but it was far easier than than for Erlang because they don't have to deal with uh, people saying, hey, no, if I apply my formatter to my 1,000 modules, it will destroy everything, blah, 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 blah. It's like, yeah, new project, formatter, great. And so, and so it's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's part of the reason is that the community is younger and more uh, proactive. And part of the reason is that uh, Erlang has a long, a huge baggage of uh, huge projects. And if you want to see one of those examples, check, uh, it, it's all open source, check uh, Kazoo, K-A-Z-O-O -O in, uh, I, I think, no, they are now 26 Hertz or something like that, but Google for Kazoo and you will find a huge open source project with several years. And, uh, and the people that works on that it's uh, it was re the team was changing a couple of years ago and one of the guys that worked with me at inaka joined the that uh, the team and uh, he had this wild idea of hey why are not are we not using a linder here in inaka we created elvis we can use it and they gave them, him the opportunity to to use it but uh, but uh, Elvis was never battle tested enough for for such a huge um, uh, size of a system, and so and so then only then we learned that uh, it was very slow and we had to optimize it. And uh, and for the Elixir community, one day there will be huge systems like that, and but since they have the tools from starting today, they will have time in between to start optimizing it as, as soon as they see that those things are not as fast as they need to be, or as good or as comprehensive as they need to be. So it's easier, yeah. Nevertheless, it's a good challenge. I like my tools. Okay, yeah, I remember that back in 2013, there was a, a podcast episode of Joseph Alin, Joe Armstrong, and Joe said, no, I, I, I use Make for compiling my Erlang code. All right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I, 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 as I'm doing the exercises, exercises, it's, it's tough to say that, but the exercises on, on the exercism, uh, I'm using Rebar, of course, because that's what they, they suggest you. And I'm using your, your formatter. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. It. It's it's easy to to configure it to use it for all my Erlang projects, so it's it's quite good. Yeah, and, that's it. Uh, but it's different, right? Because in in Elixir there is one kind of standard formatter for everyone, but in Erlang there are three. In Erlang there are four, but four. Uh, <laughs> but one of them is uh, not actively maintained because uh, because the author basically depends uh, like make it's a it's a it's predicated on you having emacs installed in your machine and emacs does all the work so so that formatter is like a, a wrapper around that and that's it but it, it exists and you can install it as in a, as a real plugin so yeah there are four formats so just a curiosity do you use Vim, Emacs, or other two? Sublime text. Sorry? Sublime text. Ah, sublime text. OK. Yeah. And there is this question by Herminio Torres again. And which are the next steps for the Erlang foundations with, uh, I believe he's saying, which, what's in the future of Erlang Foundation, Erlang Ecosystem Foundation? Yeah, I saw that question and I'm afraid I don't have an answer for I, I also will, I, I also like to know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a member of the Education Working Group 
at the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation, but uh, but I'm just a member, not even an organizer of the of this working group. And this working group is also just one of the, a small working group in the, like it, we are very far away from the decision making on the on the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation. Uh, and so I'm not that involved. I, I don't know. Great, great. But it's important for people that are listening, watching that there is this site. I'm going to leave the the, the link to the, the site, Erlang Ecosystem Foundation. It, it's easy to find also on, on Google and you can um, join it. It's yeah, free to that, join. One thing that I can tell you is what the education working group is working on. Uh, we are contributing to whatever um, open, um, what's the name, uh, educational website that appears, say uh, Future Learn, Exorcism, as you mentioned, and uh, if, if, if we find others, we will contribute as well. They have to be free, we don't want to pay membership to contribute. Uh, but we are trying to contribute as mentors on all those sites. We are waiting for uh, coronavirus to, to let us meet again. And so we will join some meetups also to try and spread the word about uh, uh, the languages we love. And we are also the res responsible for um, what's the stipends. So paying, providing money for people who wants to learn or share or teach Erlang or Elixir or whatever other language on the beam. And this year we funded, I think, five or six projects. Uh, I remember two or three, a couple of people from Africa going to a conference, a uh, teacher going from, I think it was Poland to Spain or something to, to give a lecture. Another one uh, particip giving a workshop at a, at a conference and uh, and Spawnfest, a prize for for Spawnfest and so on. And that thing will continue. So if you if you have some project beam related, learning related, and you need support, economical support for that, there is a way. It's in the Airline Ecosystem Foundation website. You fill a form. We evaluate your your case, and we can uh, help you with that. Great. So the next question, uh, you, you just said that you also sometimes write code in JavaScript. So which ideas can I take from Erlang to help me on my day-to-day -day work with JavaScript? I wrote that, uh, I read that question. I was thinking since I read it, how to answer that, but I have no clue. I, I, I struggle a lot when I have to write JavaScript. And it doesn't happen so often for me to feel comfortable with, but I I can tell you I struggle like quite hard. And uh, and it's not it's it's very different. It's a very, very different technology for a very different set of applications with completely different constraints. And if you're talking about, say, instead of JavaScript on the browser, which is the experience that I have, if you're talking about Node.js, even less so. So I, I have zero experience in that, and I won't pretend that I have. So I don't know. That's OK. And there was a, a talk a few weeks ago here by Julian Elena. She gave that talk at Elixir Conf. How Elixir made me a better Java developer <laughs> on YouTube. But I know that it's very different. Elixir and Java and Erlang and JavaScript, it's, it's different. We have in, in, uh, in ACA, in Buenos Aires, we have uh, uh, Marcelo Gornstein working with us. And he gave a talk at the PHP conference about uh, how learning Erlang helped him write better PHP code. And it was a running joke in the company that you cannot write good PHP joke, no matter what. And so, and so we 
proper porteño way, we scorn him like until the last day of the company. And we still do. <laughs> And uh, you, uh, are you in Barcelona or in Buenos I Aires? Am, I am in a, in a city called San Cugat del Valles, which is uh, right around the corner from Barcelona. I, I'm looking straight at a mountain called Tibidabo, which is right in front of me. And on the other side uh, lies Barcelona. Ah, I, moved, yes, but... I moved in January this year. Ah, okay. Oh, wow. Wow. In the the start of the the pandemic right before the pandemic yeah when the when the pandemic was in, only in china and we didn't know what what was about to happen uh we were landing here and we arranged everything here like school uh, house uh the the furniture everything just in time for the lockdown okay but it, it everything went well with your family you <laughs> that's that's for another story in a, on, on a personal call if you want i can tell you the whole story but uh, but regarding uh, regarding covid uh, yeah no problem uh, ah, okay that that was the the question because uh, here i know at the university we have some students that had problems with fathers and mothers dying it's it's oh tough. yeah yeah my family that stay those who stayed in buenos aires they all have uh, coronavirus like a couple of months ago and my brother is still uh being affected by the the uh, the sequel the, the consequences like he's he still has some uh, respiratory affection so yeah yeah it's not it's not a joke the, the disease is not a joke it's, Luckily, I am outside Barcelona because in Barcelona is also terrible. But on this side of the mountain, it's calmer, I would say. Yeah. Great. And uh, regarding SpawnFest, first question is, are you one of the creators of SpawnFest? No. Nope. <laughs> but you are, because you are listed as one of the organizers, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, in 2011, uh, I was working at Inaka, and uh, and Yuri, I will not even try to pronounce his last name, uh, Rush something, uh, created Spawnfest. And Yuri was, uh, and, like, we know, back, back in those days, if, if it, we are few online developers now, back in the day we were fewer. And uh, I think the only blogger around was Chad, my boss. He, he was uh, the writer of Erlang Inside. And he promoted uh, Spawnfest. And we also participated in it. And we won. And in 2012, we participated again and we won a prize, like a category prize, but not the main one. And then Yuri uh, left, uh, like he couldn't organize the event anymore. Many, many years later, Inaka was closed and uh, some of the folks that uh, were left out of uh, the company formed, we, we built a community of uh, open source developers just to maintain or primarily to maintain the many open source uh, repositories that were on the Inaka account in GitHub. And um, since we didn't have any more company driven events, we we were talking about, hey, remember those days when we participated on Spawnfest or not? And I was like, hey, what if we organize the thing again? And uh, and we contacted Yuri, and Yuri gave us uh, permission and credentials and whatever we needed, and and so we started organizing it in 2017, and then we organized it again in 2018 and in 2019, and then uh, I decided that I actually wanted to participate again. Organizing is it's an amazing experience, but I had some ideas. To, for, for projects that I, that I would like to, to work on on those two days. And so I was looking for somebody who take the organization role. 
and I found um, a very interesting, I found, I know, but I asked them and they said yes. Uh, it's a very, very interesting company in Buenos Aires called Ficus. They are a software cooperative. So they are like a cooperative in any other sense, but they just develop software. And um, and uh, basically they took the, the organization role and this year, 2020, they organized it. Uh, for personal reasons, I couldn't participate. So I, I already asked them to organize it again on 2021. So we'll probably, they will probably organize it again next year. And maybe I will, I will be able to participate that year finally. Great. So it, uh, I, I've met some people from Ficus in Elixir Brazil 2019. Mm, yeah. They came to Sao Paulo. And next question is by Evandro, who is here, but I don't know if he wants to talk, but uh, I'm going to ask his first question. If he wants to ask the second, just say in the chat. Uh, do you think that Elixir as a language is this, uh, Elix, Elixir? And I, I think this question should be applied more to, to Erlang. Uh, Erlang as a language designed to solve problems of a certain niche. Uh, no, I, I really don't don't didn't understand. But I, I'll try to to rephrase because for some people, Elixir is too focused. Elixir in Erlang, they are too focused. It can only be applied to a certain niche. But some people say no, you can do anything with the, the, the language as long as you adapt it to your needs. What do you think? It can be used in. Only I think, the yeah, I understand. I think uh, the original idea was uh, very narrowly, very, very narrowly focused. Uh, in the last code mesh, and soon the talks will be published. Uh, there is a, there is an Ask Me Anything session with uh, Robert Bearding, Gjarne Dacker, and I think Mike Williams, and they ask, actually asked this question to them and. They said the, the same thing that they've been saying for 30 years. Erlang was created to run on uh, network switches. Like that, that was the purpose of it, and, and that was it. They developed a language for that, specifically for that. So, so that's why, say, in the standard library, OTP, you find stuff that other languages generally don't have in the, their standard language, like drivers for Megaco, whatever that is. And uh, and you don't find stuff that you usually find in other languages, like uh, JSON parser, I'll say. And, uh, and if you go by that original goal, yeah, you have to twist it. You have to twist Erlang to make it work on other things. Are, the farther you go, the more that you have to twist the thing to make it work, right? I don't think we will ever get Erlang running on a, say, a mobile application. Stuff like that requires a completely different set of tools and, uh, and building pieces, and it has a completely different set of challenges, right? Nothing like the, the things that are, the Erlang is created for. On the other hand, time and time again, people have proven that Erlang can be used, can be used, and in, in that it's actually convenient to use in uh, unanticipated things. Uh, one of my favorite ones is like uh, it, it's Nerfs, the project that runs Erlang directly on a chip, and and when you ask Frank uh, how why why would you put Erlang on a on a Raspberry Pi or a whatever other chip that, that runs NERFs? And he will tell you that, believe it or not, the requirements are pretty similar. They, they need fault tolerance and they need good uh, concurrency and uh, hot code uh, uh, updates. So yeah, scalability, distribution, yeah, maybe those things are not the key things, but they can use the other ones that are super cool but, uh, for, for what they need. So, so uh, that's one thing. I think uh, 
stuff like web things like live view and and uh, basically anything built on top of Phoenix in Elixir is a great demonstration that those things didn't exist when Erlang was created originally, but uh, Erlang through Elixir is a great fit for building those, those kinds of applications. So there are many places where you can use it and where you can extract the benefits from it, different ones, depending on what you do. Uh, but yeah, not not for any, not for everything. It's not it's not for absolutely everything. But uh, I am still, even now and then, pleasantly surprised by a, an unsuspected application of Erlang where you don't expect to see it, but it's an amazing fit there, and it happens, and it will keep happening, I guess. As you mentioned. Co hot code reloading. Have you ever used it in production? Oh, sadly, this thing is recording. Um, uh, I, I made a huge mistake two years ago. Uh, Miriam Pena was telling me, like, she was talking about uh, hot code reloading. And uh, I think it was in a talk. I don't know if it, it was in, in within Nextral or in a conference or somewhere. And I I said, yeah, but nobody seriously uses that in production. And I was greeted with anger, like hate, because um, because for instance, uh, Fred Ebert had a, he had a, a deploy system built specifically with uh, with uh, hot code reloading at its core and uh, and the OTP team has many uh, places where they, they have so so I know I know it's very useful but uh, but I never worked in a system that I couldn't just turn off and on again and and be happy with it so I didn't need it yeah, okay because that's one one common doubt I see in discussions in the Elixir community. And what do you think are the main difficulties and most common mistakes of people trying to learn Elixir, Erlang, functional programming? And what are your advices for shortening the learning curve? Um, first of all, that article that we shared before, uh, Learn to Forget, it it still sums up what I think is the right process for learning um, these languages, but most languages. I was talking with, uh, and he will kill me, the guy that created Rust. I don't remember his name, but uh, but we were talking in, in BASConf in 2018, and, uh, and he told me that he had the same kind of uh, step step-by-step -step learning process for people to learn Rust, because if they start by just building something that works and not understanding how how they got there, uh, whenever they, they get something running, and it's amazing, but whenever they try to explain uh, or try to debug the thing that they just created, they, they struggle and they struggle a lot. So I think the right approach is to first learn um, uh, the functional programming basics, sequential Erlang, recursion, pattern matching, high order functions, processes, messages, signals, etc. So you build one thing on top of the other. And by the end of it, you don't use 90% of what you learn, you don't explicitly use, but you know that what you're using, how it works and how it's built internally. And I think it's a much more rewarding process that uh, trying to speed up the learning and build something quick and with uh, with the tools available and just have something running, whatnot. Because when you try to really, because the job, our job, is much more time uh, is spent reading code and trying to understand what it does than writing it. So if you if you can write something fast, good for you. But it's much better if you can understand what's going on in a system fast. So, yeah, I think that's that's the main that's the main thing. Uh, instead of trying to flatten the, the learning curve, just embrace it, right? go with it. 
learn all the way and you will get the rewards at the end. On the other hand, what are the most common uh, mistakes that people made when learning Erlang? Um, is that uh, it happens a lot in exorcism, like all the time, is that people don't use pattern matching as much as they should. It's like everybody, everybody that comes to exorcism starts writing the, the code and they write if, they write cases, and they write uh, very dumb stuff like uh, if you want to if you want to do something if the list is empty and something else if the list has elements instead of pattern matching on the on the empty list and the list with something the the robot bat they they length they case on the length of the list and that's another operation on top of the list that is not necessary it's dumb and it's fast and you will not notice that that is a problem until you have a huge system with millions of concurrent tasks. But uh, but a good thing to to keep in mind when you're learning Erlang and many other functional languages is that the less uh, keywords that you use, the better. How much much pattern matching, much, uh, as much pattern matching recursion and functions that you can use, the better. That, that's one, one of the reasons I, I love exorcism, is that I learned these kind of things from you and also from other mentors in Elixir track. I believe Evandro wrote that Graydon Hoare is the creator of Rust. Was that Graydon Hoare? Maybe. I, I honestly don't remember. <laughs> oh, the, okay. And uh, I was, there was a, a talk on code bean called from 10 seconds to a thousand seconds no i don't know what's doing but it was a talking talk from anton lavrick from from whatsapp and he told uh, he said something like this there are these erlang limitations no stack static typing flat namespace for records and modules lack of well-integrated tooling, and he included the formatter. What do you think about this? Uh, static typing, I was a small talk developer back then, and I loved it. And so I don't have any love for static typing. On the other hand, I think Dialyzer is an amazing tool, and everybody should use it. And, and even if it's uncomprehensible in the way it, it speaks, it's like, uh, it, it, it's like a, an old uh, grandpa, grumpy old man complaining uh, at your code. But uh, every time it complains, there, you have something to fix there. There is no mistake. It always finds stuff. Uh, but on the other hand, static typing, I, I never enjoy that that much. I know the benefits. I never... I. I never find myself in a situation where I will say, I will complain because I found a bug that could have been fixed by, by static typing. Anytime that that would be a case, I would say, damn it, a test would have caught this bug, not, not a typing. So yeah, maybe, I don't know. The flat namespace for records, yes, use opaque data structures, stop using records in plain sight, don't share records and you will be much happier with with that like i promise you it's it solves problems that you don't even think you have it's a, it's a completely different thing i gave more than a talk i think i gave one in spanish and one in english or two in spanish and two in english something like that about opaque data structures if you didn't watch them watch them it's a uh, it reshapes the way you build your uh, you organize your data in Erlang or maybe Elixir systems, and uh, and you don't care anymore. I I didn't have a problem with the uh, with uh, names with record names like in the last decade. I, ha I, I never had a problem with that, and all my records have the same name. Ninety percent of them are called state, and I don't care because th they are not shared. Doesn't matter, and. Um, the namespace of modules, yeah, that hit me once or twice. 
And uh, the usual way of solving that with the prefixes and the underscores is ugly, and I agree. I remember when, like, around 10 years ago, the OTP, I think, 11 or something, they did have something akin to namespaces, and it was a mess. It was a complete mess. And, uh, and yeah, yeah, true, that one, uh, it, it's there, and it's uh, it's ugly, and and there is no work around it. And uh, the integrated tooling, yeah. <laughs> uh, what can we say about it? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And uh, and considering that we had the river in the in the community for like five, six years, seven years, I don't know, before ODP finally decided to sanction it as a as a standard tool for, for Erlang, and they didn't even include it in OTP. It's like, Rebar is the Rebar is the tool that you have to use it, but it's, on a, it's somewhere else, right? It, it, it's, yeah, yeah, that, that's, the, that's what you have to do there, like not us, you. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's how it is. I, I think that's not likely, that's not going to change in the near future. Rebar 3, XPM, they, those things are doing... Uh, uh, we are far, far better than we were like two, three years ago, but not, we are not not even near what Elixir has, not, not by far, like Elixir is far more advanced on tooling. And uh, yeah, we do what we can. <laughs> okay. And this question is from Anonymous, so I don't know who is it, is, is it from, but, and, and I, I don't agree with the way it's worded, but, and how do you think is the best way to combine functional programming with other paradigms? Why I, I don't like this, the, the wording, because maybe you, you think that it's not okay to combine functional programming with other <laughs> paradigms. <laughs> I don't, no, I don't know. Like, I I can tell you what I did. I actually, a couple of years ago, I gave a talk called From Erlang to Java and Back Again. And, uh, and that was my experience combining specifically Erlang with Java because we needed a Lucene server, which is uh, some extremely powerful search engine built in Java, and there is no there is no way we could ever implement something like that in Erlang. Definitely no way. So we needed to combine those things. But luckily, there is a there is a, a library called J Interface that comes with ODP that allows you to to interconnect Erlang nodes with uh, Java nodes. So, but that that's kind of cheating because it's not combining functional programming with Java. It's more like combining an Erlang node uh, with a Java thing. Uh, I don't know. I don't generally combine functional programming with other paradigms other than uh, just executing uh, non-functional things uh, from, from uh, Erlang side. And most of my experience on that uh, front is uh, using uh, Erlang not as a functional programming per se, but as a as a distributed uh, language, as a concurrent language to to do the control stuff around uh, uh, non-functional tools like uh, object-oriented or or procedural or whatever. Say the that Lucene server. What we did was a. Uh, multi-node Lucene uh, database that have many Lucene nodes all connected with the uh, with Erlang node. And uh, the last thing I, I did like that was uh, was um, a reverse proxy that the, the proxying code was built in Go and the control mechanism was built in Elixir on top of Go. So yeah, they are independent, they work together. Okay, so the, the last question, we were about to end our transmission here. And is there any obscure pitfall with Erlang in production? 
clearly that person didn't read my blog uh but yes many and uh if you want to find them all just go to the Erland battleground and you will have around 60 60 articles more or less that i've been writing since 2016 if i remember correctly and yeah many all of them are minor they are workarounds and 90% of them are all based on somebody doing or trying to do something hacky with Erlang. But uh, but if you try, yeah, you can find, yeah, many. That's great. Thank you very much. Brujo, do you want to say anything else about you? I'm going to leave the, the links to your LinkedIn page, your blogs, but do, do you want to say anything else? Um, I would say I would say something that I already said. The community is not huge. Even the Elixir community, which is larger than the Erlang community, is not huge. So a good thing to do is for all to participate. The community is uh, the community. The, the general ecosystem is very very welcoming. I I know a couple other ecosystems. Say I I were, I participated in the Ruby. Uh, ecosystem in Buenos Aires for a long time, also the Haskell ecosystem and whatnot. And our our community is super welcoming, so so don't hesitate. Like uh, we know that uh, learning these languages is not trivial, uh, but we are all here to help. So follow Adolfo and join Exorcism, join our Slack channels, read the blogs. Go, go on Twitter. If you find me on Twitter, you can ask me anything and not only myself. Say uh, Sasa is also very active on Twitter and uh, Michal, uh, Fred, and even Jose and many others. So uh, don't despair and just look for help. We are here to help all the time. Thank you very much, Brujo. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.